I'm going to talk to you this morning in our Nehemiah series as we continue in that on the people rising, uh, people coming back. And today we're going to specifically talk about how to pray when the enemy attacks, how to pray when the enemy attacks. And that's, that's a very real thing. We, we live in, in enemy occupied territory. So we got to get our hearts and minds aligned with that. All right. I want to pray this morning, and then let's get started. God, we thank you for a chance to look at your word. We thank you for a chance to be alert, to be ready, to wake up, to engage our minds in the power of Holy Scripture. God, we pray that you would give us the ability to engage you this morning and think about ourselves as we do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to talk to you about how to pray when the enemy attacks. What does that look like? What does that feel like? Because it's a very real thing. Before I I get into this this morning, before we get into Nehemiah, I want to show you and remind you of a verse. If you missed last week's sermon, it was phenomenal. You really need to go back. Y'all are totally not awake. Like, not at all, okay? No, but if if you did miss last week's sermon, seriously... I want you to go back and listen to it because we're talking about the reality of the enemy. Today, we're talking about how to pray about that. And I want to bring up a verse that we looked at last week, but I want you to see this. What does Paul say? Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against people. Our struggle is against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness. Where? In the heavenly places. We live in enemy-occupied territory. I'll show you a picture of a friend of mine. This is uh, Brad Borders. And uh, I happened to look on it. I I found a picture. I couldn't believe I found a picture of him in combat. Brad is a a good friend, and uh, Brad was a special forces chaplain. And so he, uh, he literally would go into combat. As you can see right there, he would go outside the wire. And one day I was talking to Brad, and he's in North Carolina. And uh, after he got done, he worked for Dr. David Jeremiah for a while. And, and uh, he was, uh, he's just got so many neat stories. But we were talking about combat, and, and Brad, um, Brad, you know, as a chaplain in, uh, in, in that type of arena, it's a whole different, different thing. And, and he said, you know, Jason, he said, it's interesting, in every one of our remote bases, uh, when we out in the fighting units, there's a wire. And I forgot how far out it was, but I'm going to say quarter mile, half mile outside the, the base. He said, so if anything trips that wire, or if anything, anything comes through that, that, that force field, if you will, we know. He said, but every time, he said, it's interesting life inside the compound, you know, several hundred or even, you know, maybe 500 to a thousand, uh, you know, soldiers. He said, they'll be joking around, playing ping pong, shooting basketball, lifting weights, you know, they're doing all the things they do. He said, but it's interesting on the day and knowing these guys, he walks close with all of them. He said, but I would know if like this company was going to go out on a, on a mission that day. I would know who's up to bat, if you will. He said it was interesting to watch their demeanor change. They would go from ping pong, goofing off, uh, picking on each other, cutting on each other, have, just being guys. And then when it was their day, there was no laughter. It was all business. He said because when, when those Humvees, when that gate lifts... We're already on the radio. We're already listening. And when the gate lifts, you hear the chatter. There comes the talking. You hear all the enemy. They have scouts. He said, and those guys knew the moment moment they crossed that threshold from their own, that could be the last day of their life. He said, so their attitude, they go from being soldiers to killers. They're not playing around. Everybody out there is an enemy. Everybody. Everybody is an enemy. He said it was fascinating to watch that whole demeanor change. Man, you know, guys, the thing about living in enemy-occupied territory is we live in a great county and a great place to live, but just because we don't see the enemy doesn't mean he's not out there. 
Doesn't mean that, 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 that when that gate comes out and you walk out into the world every day, there's things coming at you. They just look different than a terrorist. It's a different kind of terrorist. And you have to have your mind alert. So I want you to turn to Nehemiah 4 this morning. If you don't know where Nehemiah is at, uh, find the Psalms kind of in the middle of your Bible and go back to the left a little and you'll hit Nehemiah. And I love Nehemiah. I've read through this book a lot. I love his attitude. Now, here's what's happening. They're in the middle of building the wall and the enemy has come. Samballot, Tobiah, and Geshem, those are the big three. Have you ever noticed, by the way, that the enemy doesn't fight by itself? Spiritual forces, not force. Wickedness, plural, in the heavenly places. I don't know how the devil does all that, but I do know he has an army. And evidently the heat's getting turned up because he's getting frustrated. The enemy is here. Nehemiah 4, so... Now, uh, verse one. So now when it, chapter four, verse one, when it came about that Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious and very angry and he mocked the Jews. He spoke, in, he spoke in the presence of his brothers and the wealthy men of Samaria. So he had a crowd. And he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Are they going to restore it for themselves? Can they offer sacrifices? Can they finish it in a day? Can they revive the stones from the dusty rubble, even the burned ones? Tobiah, the Ammonite, was near him. And then he says, well, even what they are building, if a fox should jump on it, he'd break the stone wall down. Seinfeld, an Old Testament version. <laughs> Verse 4, now Nehemiah prays. Boy, you better, better listen to this. If you're taking notes, you better take good ones now. Hear, O God, how we are despised. Return their reproach on their own heads and give them up for plunder in a land of captivity. Boy, he, he went to the mat, didn't he? I mean, <laughs> you don't want Nehemiah praying against you, friends. I'll tell you that. Verse 5, do not forgive their iniquity. Let not their sin be blotted out before you, for they have demoralized the builders. And that was his prayer. So we built the wall. And the whole wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Now, when Sanballat, Tobiah, and the Arabs and the Ammonites, and all these men, they, were, they, they, they heard about this, they became very angry. And then in verse 8, it says they conspired. Look at, look at this. All of them conspired together. The enemy joins ranks to come together, fight against who? Jerusalem. And do what? Cause a disturbance in it. Their aim was to stir up confusion. Have you ever noticed this about your enemy? That he's a master of riding in on what God is doing. You ever noticed that? God is doing something great among your friends, maybe among your school. God is starting to do something good. The, the enemy is a master at stirring up confusion. He's a master at that. Why? Because he's a master liar. He's a master liar. So he's, he's, he's really good at confusing the mind. So today we're going to talk about how do you pray when you're under attack? How do you pray? Here's the, the one. Number one, learn to pray immediately. Learn, and I mean that. I said that by, by design. Learn to pray immediately. Nehemiah, if you start to notice him, y'all, you'll start to notice something about this guy. He, he, he's the, he's a, a champion of short prayers. He does pray a lot, but they're short prayers. You'll notice there's times that he tells us what he prayed, but oftentimes it just says, and I prayed. So right here in this moment, here's one thing I think is kind of interesting in verse 4. In, in verse 3, I don't know if Nehemiah can hear him. I don't know if he's in the crowd. Maybe it was that he got the report of what was said. But what did he do? Immediately the guy prayed. He, he didn't go consult somebody, what should I do? He probably did that later, I would assume. He didn't go and just start thinking about all the ways he could rally the troops. That all came later. The first thing he did was he, he prayed. I believe that's what Paul's getting at when he says pray without ceasing. It doesn't mean that you walk around like a monk, you know, just talking to, you, talking to yourself. All the time. People are going to think you're weird. All right? That's, that's, not what, that's not what he's doing there. He learned he had muscle memory. You know, I, I was at a Titans game. Hadn't been to a whole lot of those, but it was, it was many, many years ago. And I remember I was down. I, I, don't, I can't remember it exactly, but I can't remember if I was on the field or I was very close to the field. And I remember watching, watching their wide receivers warming up the quarterbacks. And, and these quarterbacks would be throwing uh, and, and had three or four wide receivers, and they were all warming up the quarterbacks. But I just happened to notice something. 
Every time that a wide receiver would catch a football, they would all tuck it immediately. They would grab the nose of the football and and put the point of the football in in their armpit, their hand on top, and it was ball security. But it was interesting, they all did it like robots. Then I got to really watching him. I happened to notice every time this one would catch it, he would, he would tuck it. He would catch it, tuck it. And it was just, it was, he wasn't even thinking. And I thought, I wonder if they all do that. And I watched all down the line, boom, whoosh, bam. And, and it was this muscle memory. They just did it automatically. It, it came from hours and hours and hours and hours of doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. It was mastery by repetition. I think Nehemiah prayed immediately because he had taught himself to do that. This guy was vulnerable, man. I mean, when you, when you hear him say, hero, oh God, how we're despised, he's vulnerable. He's in territory he hadn't walked in before. You know, when life throws you a curveball, you don't know what to do, learn to pray fast, build the muscle memory. But I'll tell you something else that he did. We, we see that when it comes to praying against the enemy, pray aggressively. Boy, now this is something I need, I need you to make sure you stay with me. Pray aggressively for God's kingdom to be advanced. Now this is going to push you a little bit, and it's going to challenge you a little bit. And I mean for it to. It's not easy if you look at what he prayed. Because I'm going to tell you, I don't know about you, but I'm not used to being around people that pray for all of holy wrath to come down on somebody they're against. You don't learn that, you know down when Shane and Jenny are bringing you up through children's worship, right? Go get them, God. Get every one of them, right? I mean, Baptists don't pray like that. Methodists do, but Baptists don't. I'm just kidding. (laughs) I'm just totally joking. You got to relax, right? But my daddy was Methodist. I can pick on my daddy when he grew up. But but you 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 don't pray that way. What does it mean to pray aggressively for God's kingdom? Well, look in chapter four, verse one. Now, it came about when Sanballat heard they were rebuilding the wall. He became furious and angry, and he mocked Nehemiah. No. He mocked the Jews. He hated God's people. He hated the cause. He hated the project because he hated the God that was originating it. He thought he owned all this land, and now he saw that he didn't. When you see in verse 2, when he's mocking them, you see right there where he says, can they offer sacrifices? You know what he's basically saying? What are you going to do? You're going to sacrifice to your God now? Is that what you're going to pray? Going to come to church? Hope it gets better? Going to cry out on the name of Jesus? That would be New Testament language for what he's doing right there. What are you going to do? He's mocking them. So you need to understand. Look at what Nehemiah says in Verse 5, when he's praying, why does he ask for this? They were demoralizing the builders. Understand, friends, you better hear me. To mock the work was to mock God. To mock the work was to mock God. And that's why he prayed the way he prayed. You see, when you look at Nehemiah, you can't lose sight of something, you guys. Nehemiah wasn't a prophet. You know, so many of you in the last few weeks have told me how much you love Nehemiah. I I do too. You know why? I think we can identify with this guy. He just had a regular job. That's why I love the prophet Amos. Amos was a farmer. He grew figs. And then God said, I need you to go tell the king something. And he goes, and and Amos goes and tells the king something and tells him what's going to happen. And the, the state preacher, the preacher that was owned by the state says, hey, fig picker, go back to picking figs. That's what he told him. And Amos said, I tell you what, not only will I go back to farming when I'm ready, but I'm going to tell you what's going to happen to your wife. They're going to kill her and drag her in the streets. I mean, this guy had no backup. He's a farmer. God chooses people. He chose Nehemiah, and Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king. He was just a servant. That's all he was, but he wasn't a prophet, and he doesn't talk like a prophet, and he wasn't a theologian, and he doesn't talk like a theologian, and he doesn't pray like a theologian. And what I love about that is when he saw, hear me now, this is important. The reason the way that he prayed the way he prayed is because God had called him. Hey, Nehemiah, I got a cause, and I need you to build this wall for me. Well, then he sees these enemies coming against him, and he says, hey, God, that's not right. It was very simple justice for him. That's not right. 
I don't, I don't, I, that, that's not what you called him. That, this, is, this is something wrong right here. Go get him, God. Go get him. Right? Now, this isn't, this is different language, man. It was a very simple mind for justice. In the New Testament, boy, you, you wouldn't hear people like us praying that way. But isn't it strange that God answered his prayer? Look in verse 15. When our enemies heard that it was known to us, that is, when our enemies heard that we were on to them, and, and who frustrated? That God had frustrated their plan. Then all of us returned to work. Now, how did God answer the prayer? Well, Nehemiah prayed, God, do something. Do something. See, that's, that's something you got to understand, you guys. When you see an Old Testament Jew, when you, when you hear them asking for God's ear, answer God, answer God, answer God, that's not how Americans pray. When we ask God to deliver, we're basically saying most of the time, if you listen to yourself pray, I'm, I'm guilty of this, I'm not kidding. I mean, you'll say, it's basically, God, give me what I think I need. Deliver me the way I think this thing should play out. I know what's best for my family. Maybe you don't. Maybe you don't. I know, I know what my job needs. Maybe you don't. You're, between you and God, only one of y'all is all-knowing. Right? Not as many amens right there. <laughs> yeah, it's hard, isn't it? So when you hear an Old Testament Jew saying, hear me, God, you know what he's saying? He's saying, do something. Do something. Do something, God. What does God do? Look in verse 12. Or let's start in verse 11. Our enemy said, well, they will not know or they will not see until we come up among them, kill them, and put a stop to the work. They weren't playing around. They were outside the wire. So when the Jews, these weren't Nehemiahs. Listen, this is different people. So when the Jews who were, who lived near them, who's them? Sanballat, Tobiah. I mean, they had houses too. Right? So evidently there were some people living around in the community that weren't really opening up to the fact that they were on Nehemiah's side. So they're hearing some of this stuff. They get wind of it in verse 12, verse 11. They come to him in verse 12 and they said, hey, they will come up against us from every place where you may turn. That's how God answered the prayer. He had recon. Nehemiah knew, uh-oh, they're coming. And not only are they coming, don't miss this, not only are they coming, they're not coming from one angle. They're coming from the north, the south, the east, and the west. They're going to surround us, and they're going to all bum rush us at once. So what does, that's an 80s word for those of you students that don't know what that means. They're going to come at us from every angle. So do something, God. Do something, verse 4. And may, he's, he's basically aligning himself with God. He's aligning himself. You want to pray, let me tell you, when the enemy comes at you, when the enemy comes at your family, when the enemy comes at your kids, let me tell you how you pray. You ask God. If you want to ask, if you want to pray and be aggressive in the way you pray, start this way. God, you make your name great and I will align my life to meet with that. You see, that's how, you, that's how Jesus, when Jesus said, you ever notice that Jesus said, you can pray and I'll give you whatever you wish. You pray where? In my name. What is that, what is that indicative of? An alignment. It's an alignment. It's falling subservient to who God is. God, make your name great. Do whatever you need to do. I'll adjust. Listen. I'll adjust my life. However I need to adjust my life, that, friends, is called obedience. That's called obedience. Now, I want you to stop for a second. Look around today's culture. Look around your life, your own life. In 2018, we don't even use language anymore in the American culture that says, I need to change me. I need to change my life. 
to a cause from God. We don't, we don't do that. So when the enemy comes, the reason he can, the reason, follow me, the reason that he can say, bring this down on their heads, God. You know why? Because God, I, I'm only doing what you said to do. They're not just trying to come against me. They're trying to come against you. They don't like you. They hate you. They don't want it to happen. God, have your way with them. Make your name great. Pray aggressively. Pray aggressively. I want to give you a, um, what, before I move on to the next one, I want, I want to share with you all something. If you think this doesn't show up in the New Testament, it actually does. I want you to look on the screen at Luke 10, 10. Jesus is talking. He's just sent out the 70. And he says, whatever city that you enter, they're out sharing the gospel. Whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into the streets, number one, and you say, he tells them what to say, even the dust of your city which clings to our feet, we will wipe off in protest against you. Yet be sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come near. Then look at what Jesus says. I say to you, disciples, it will be more tolerable in the day for Sodom than for that city. We think of Jesus as the Lamb of God, and he was. But let me tell you something, friends. We have gone a long way from remembering that he's the Lion of Judah. He's the Lion of Judah. And what's he saying right there? Do the work of God. Do the work of God. When you, want to, when, you want to, when you want to come and pray and the enemy's coming against you, the number one thing I could say to you, align your life. Align your life. Submit your life to God and submit the desires of your heart in the situation with your kids, your money, your job, whatever you're facing in your family. Align your heart to God. And then when you ask for things, you're in alignment with what you're asking for. And that's when you can expect God to answer you. That's how you pray when the enemy attacks. Now, I'm going to tell you another one, too, this morning about how to pray when the enemy attacks. It's going to sound a little, little bit different, but I would say, to, say it to you this way. It's about joy. Pray for joy in the fight. Pray for joy in the fight. All right? Now, I don't want you to turn there, but I thought about this verse a lot this week. I just want you to write it down. Look at James chapter 1. I put it on the screen for you. What did James say? Consider it what joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? Endurance. Your Bible might say patience. It produces patience or endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, I'm going to leave that up there for a minute. I'm going to tell you a great way to study your Bible. I do this all the time. Flip it. Turn it into the negative. So what happens if if you don't do this? If you you just buckle down and weather out the storm in trials, so don't let endurance have its perfect work, then you'll end up incomplete and you will be lacking, right? If you don't do that, you will be incomplete and you will be lacking. Here's the reality, friends. Whatever you're going through right now, whatever you're experiencing, church, family, friends, job, whatever you're experiencing, you're going to need, hear me now, you're going to need what you're going through now. You're going to need that later. You're gonna, it's why people that are older than us don't freak out so much because they've seen stuff, right? Tony Vaughn's 130. He's seen a lot, right? That's why he doesn't freak out. I love being around saints of God that are on up in years. It'll work out. But what if it doesn't? It'll work out. Be calm. Let patience have its work. Let patience have its work. If you don't, the next battle that comes, and oh, there's going to be another battle. It's going to look different. It's going to be different. It's going to sound different. It's going to be with a different person, a different situation. You won't know what to do. You know, if, if all you do, watch me, if all you do is when the battle comes, you just plant down, come on, put your head down, let's go. All right? If that's all you do, if you just brace, if you just brace for the hit, then all you do is just endure the rain until it's over, just batten down until it's over. I'm not saying it doesn't work, but here's what I am saying. You don't learn anything. 
If all you're doing is trying to get through the storm, you don't learn anything. You become embittered because you have the storm. You have to endure the storm. No, lift your eyes to the hills from whence come your help. Lift your eyes. Look into the face of God and don't just endure it. I had a, a friend of mine, this is a true story. He had a, a, a neighbor and his neighbor had a golden retriever and they had, a, uh, they had a, um, an, one of those invisible fences and this dog kept getting out all the time. And so he, he ran that thing up to about like the highest level. He's like, I will show you. And it worked for a while. And then one day, this is awesome. Then one day he, uh, he said, I have to look outside and I saw my dog. So, you know, they, they, they know where the line is. I used to have one of these years ago and our dogs would get, they kind of knew right where to stop. I had a friend of mine say, well, your dog came out to greet me and just locked up. I'm like, yeah, because if it doesn't, it's going to lock up. Yeah. <laughs> And, and so, and it was, it was just coming out just, you know, happy, but it just stopped. It's like, well, I want it. And it's like, come on. And uh-uh, you know, he said, so he looks out his window and there's his dog and his dog's up to the line. And he said, he just starts going, just shaking, shaking. And he's getting pumped up because then he just takes off running through it. And he's like, ah, 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 he's just, yeah. and he's just, until he runs out of the range where the collar can't receive the signal anymore. And now he's just, he's, he's, so he endures the shock. He said, I'm going, did that really just happen? He said, that dog is crazy. And so he gets his dog back in. He noticed the next day and he, 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 he I watch him walk up and he walks up to the line, he starts shaking. And then he just goes, right? I mean, it's hilarious. He just endure the pain till it's over, right? Don't do that. Don't do that. It's not fun when you're going through stuff like this. But listen, friends, if you don't learn to fight the small battles, when the big ones come, you are sunk. You're sunk. A friend of mine's a professor at Baylor. And uh, we were having a talk the other day. Uh, we were on the phone talking about just the millennial generation and, 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 and the, all the, the interesting things we see. And, and, and you know, my generation is not perfect. They said things about my generation. And, they're going, and by all the way, students, they're going to say things about your generation. It'll come. Just watch. And, and, but he said, you know, we're starting to hear this new term as professors. You know, Dale's probably 55 and he said, uh, all these students, 18 to 22. And he said, um, we're starting to hear this term, lawnmower parent. And I thought, boy, he said, but let me tell you something, Jason, there's something to it. An article had come out, lawnmower parents, this uh, We Are Teachers put out a post. It says, chances are you've met this breed of parent. In raising children who have experienced minimal struggle, we are not creating a happier generation of kids. We're creating a generation that has no idea what to do when they actually encounter struggle. You know what a lawnmower parent is? Now, a helicopter parent, some of you don't put your head down because I'll know who you are. Don't do it. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But a helicopter parent choreographs every move because, you, know, you know, God forbid that my kid doesn't get the same opportunity that your kid got and what's going to happen. Then I'm behind, right? I mean, that's how we do. We, we're all, we, I mean, none of us, let's just face it, myself, Michelle included, none of us are objective about our kids. Can we just admit that? Amen or oh me, right? We're just not objective about it. We're just not, Right? So we, a helicopter parent choreographs every little move, just so afraid that they're not going to get the opportunity. A lot more parents are different. A lot more parents, they're mowing down any obstacle, buddy. I mean, any obstacle in the way of their kid, they're mowing it down because they want their kid to have the best life possible. But I'm here to tell you, friend, you can do that, actually. You can actually do that. And you know what? It'll actually work until the moment they leave your home and then life's going to smack them won't it? And then they're going to show up to work one day late. Their boss is going to be like, hey, what? You, what? Oh, I, I just wasn't feeling good. Well, you know what? Neither was I. Here's this thing. It's, it's called a notice. See ya. But you can't, oh, I, no, I did. It's over. I'm not your parent. We have a business to run. Life's going to spank them, right? It's life. Let me tell you something, man. 
I told a friend of mine the other day, they had had their first kid, and he said, I said, I'm going to tell you something, buddy. You think you know what pain is. There is no pain in this world like the pain of your kids. When your kids hurt, you feel so helpless. I mean, it is the worst feeling in the world. But I'm here, listen to me. Listen to me, people. Listen to me. Let your kids fail. Let them fail. Let them learn to trust God, not just you. Let them fail. Let them get a bloody nose. And don't go calling the police on some 12-year-old kid who hits your kid. Maybe your kid needed to be hit. Sorry, Ben, back it up. Could have been. All right, that's the first question my daddy would have asked. Do you deserve it? All right? My daddy would have said that. Did you hit him back? That would have been the second question. All right? I, I'm just telling you, I grew up in the real world, buddy. All right? My daddy would have never dreamed of calling some other dad because two of us 12-year-olds got in a fight, you know? My, you know it's, I'm just telling you, honest. My I'm so glad that I had parents that let me fail. I'm serious. They let me stand on their own. I even asked my dad about it once we started having kids. I said, Dad, did you ever see times that I was really going to go off the cliff? He said, a whole, a ton. I said, what did you do? He said, nothing. I mean, if it was going to get real bad, I'd probably stepped in. But I wanted you to feel the pain of your decisions at times. Boy, I can't imagine now being on this end of parenting, how hard that is. But I want to tell you something. It taught me a lot. It taught me that my mom and dad, they weren't going to rescue me out of everything. That my decisions mattered, and I had to own them. See, we're mowing obstacles down, and you, you just, you, you can't do it. You can't do it. The thing about Nehemiah that I loved is that Nehemiah wasn't afraid of the struggle. I love what it said in, in verse 6. It says, so we built the wall. I mean, how about that? Amongst all the attacks, it's the most simple sentence of resolve. Get them, God. Hear, hear, hear what they're doing to you. They've demoralized the builders. So we built the wall. He built the wall. He didn't shun the struggle. You know why Nehemiah didn't shun the struggle? Listen to me, Christian. This is why he didn't shun the struggle. Because he stood not on what he saw. He stood on what he knew. He didn't stand on what he saw out there in front of him. He didn't stand on all this junk. He didn't stand on all the stuff that he saw the enemy doing. He stand, he, took, he, he, just, he just stood, took a stand on what God had called him to do. And that gave him peace and it gave him resolve. Find joy in the fight. I didn't say you got to like it. What is joy, by the way? What is joy? Joy is not circumstantial, is it, right? Happiness is like a new vehicle. Reality is the payment. Right? Happiness is circumstantial. Joy, mm mm, that's internal. That comes from Jesus. The only place you're going to get it. it comes from Jesus. Nehemiah was not an eternal optimist. Mm mm. No, he was an eternal realist. But he knew what he knew. He knew what he knew. Find joy in that. I'm going to give you another one here this morning. I would say to you, Pray from the middle. When it comes to praying against the enemy, pray from the middle of God's people. Pray from the middle. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Look in verse 9. I love this verse. Oh, I love it. They all conspired against us to cause confusion, but we prayed to our God. Because of them, we set up a guard. Pray from the middle. He, pray, he prayed together. They came together in the fight. They came together. It said in verse 6 that the people had a mind to work that the, the, the turbulence had actually brought them unity. Don't you love that? That they were together in a cause. The people had a mind. They, they had a desire to do the work. And so they prayed together and they prayed and set up guard together. Pray from the middle of God's people. Let me tell you what I, I mean by that. I want to show you a picture. This is the, uh, I think it's, we called it the Sag. It was called the Sag River. That river is the, the Sag Veritok or something like that. It's an old Russian name. That, that river right there, where I, I did not take that particular picture, but I was right up in that area of Alaska, about 60 miles from the Arctic Ocean. Had I gone any further, I'd have gone over the top of the earth. I, I was filming a project up there for the Alaska Baptist Convention and many, many years ago. And uh, what you, that, that, that river's flowing to, to the sea, so it's actually flowing uh, to, to, the, to the top of the screen. And off to the right, back toward the east, 
there's a, an old oil exploration road, but that, that, that river right there had a lot of those, all that, those sandbars, that was hard packed sand. And we, we'd walk across that, we'd get across the Sag River on a canoe, and then we'd go out and, and, and go into where the caribou were. And, and so we, that was, I remember, I had all this gear, and I'm walking down one of these sandbars, and, and I happened to look down, and I, ha- I remember I had all my stuff on my shoulder, camera, because we were, we were in the middle, had to be ready to film at any moment. And, and uh, I happened to look down in my boot. I wear a, about a 12 and a half. Uh, and I looked down and my boot was inside of a grizzly print. So he at least wore a 20, <laughs> right? My boot was inside the Tundra Grizzlies print. And I really didn't want to look up because that's sand and it rains a lot. And I thought that's, 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 that's probably today. And the only thought I had, and I'm not, not normally this contemplative or this deep, but standing there with my boot in that grizzly print, claws and all, the only thought I had was, you're not the only hunter here. You're not the only hunter here. We live in enemy-occupied territory. And here's what some of you are doing. Some of you are living on the margins. You know, I ran across all out in that tundra. That's, that's when it's blooming. It's about to go frozen right now. But all out in that tundra, you know what I found? Bones. I, I found them all the time. Bones. Caribou bones. Kill sites. Kill sites where grizzlies had attacked a caribou. But you know the caribou they always go after? the one that gets off from the herd. There's strength in numbers. And so by staying together, they stayed alive. Some of you in here this morning, you're getting beat up by the devil. You know why? Because you're by yourself. You're out on the margins. You're not the only hunter around. You have a real enemy. And Nehemiah said they came together. I love it. We, we prayed to our God. We prayed to our God. You've got to pray from the middle of God's people. Stop being on the outskirts. Come to the middle of God's people and let us surround you. If you're going through something, let us surround you. Pray from the middle. Be together. It works, man. It works. And the last thing I'm going to say to you is this. Pray and fight. Pray and fight. The last thing I'm going to say. Pray and fight. So Nehemiah said in verse 6, so he built the wall. Now I want you to turn over to verse 16. Oh, I love this. Uh, after, so in, in verse 15, it tells us that God had frustrated their plans, each to his own work. Now look what he said. And from that day on, half my servants carried on the work of, and half of them held spears, shields, and bows. Half of them worked, half of them stood guard. Verse 17, those who were rebuilding the wall and those who carried burdens took their load. Look at this. Oh, it's one of the most famous verses in all Nehemiah. They took their load with one hand doing the work and the other hand holding the weapon. Don't you love that? One, one hand putting a brick on, one hand with a sword. Looking this way, put a brick. Look this way. They, he even goes on to say that we wouldn't even go get water without our weapon. Verse 21, so we carried on the work. Verse 20, and whatever, he puts them all throughout the wall and he tells them, when you hear the trumpet, you come. That's where the battle's at. Our God will fight for us. So we carried the work with half of them holding spears from dawn until the stars appeared. He first says in verse 23, so neither I or my brothers or my servants nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us removed our clothes, each took his weapon, even to the water. Fight, 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 pray and fight. Listen, you don't have to, you don't have to give up ground just because you think you're in enemy occupied territory. And he just, he just, that's just what happens. You know, he just beats up on you. I did some radio interviews this week. Many of them actually, every time uh, uh, I've got a, book coming out on raising boys and but every time a, a, a book comes out the the um the, the the media house wants to do all the radio interviews and I'm like stack them in a day let's get it over with and but I'll tell you something that, that hit me this week that was kind of interesting I probably did 10 12 interviews in a day it's all across the country on the radio and and there were two or three times that producers the radio hosts would almost forget they were on the air. 
and they were asking me questions. Jason, what do you do if your 18 or 20 year old son or daughter, it's almost just too late. They've gone their own way. What do you do when your teenage son, your teenage daughter, when they just don't listen anymore? And you could hear in their voice, they were talking about themselves. And I'll tell you what I told them. I said, listen, I would say to whoever parent that is, fight for your home. Fight for your home. That's your house. Fight for your home. Own your home. You don't have to be a jerk. You don't have to be mean. You don't have to be ugly. But you take control in the name of Jesus in your house. Take control in the name of Jesus. Pray over your children. Make them pray with you. You know, I don't care if they're looking you eye to eye anymore unless they want to be homeless. Unless you want, if you want to eat today, you're praying. How about that? Right? They don't have to agree with you, believe you. Listen, fight for your family. I love what Nehemiah said in chapter four when he saw all their fear in verse 14. I rose and I spoke to the nobles and I said, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Fight for your brothers, fight for your sons, verse 14. Fight for your daughters, fight for your wives, fight for your houses. Fight, fight and pray. Weapon in one hand, brick in the other. 